it's always nice to have a chance to connect, reconnect. And especially on this very happy occasion where uh, we have seen another side of Wayne Caldwell. Uh, I've loved his, his novels and uh, the beauty of those books. And now he's given us a, a book of poetry and you can see I'm already marking my favorite poems in here. Uh, Woodsmoke, beautiful book, uh, beautifully done. And um, I'm just, uh, it, I, I was telling Wayne earlier that I think one of the most interesting aspects about Appalachian writers is this connection where we, we, we don't seem to be afraid of, of writing both prose and poetry. There's a, there's a long tradition uh, you, uh, that James Steele, certainly Jesse Stewart, um, more recently, Robert Morgan, uh, Rita Quillen has a novel out. She's been a poet, uh, Fr Fred Chapel, of course. So uh, it, it's interesting and uh, to see Wayne uh, go into this, go into poetry, but also what struck me when I read Woodsmoke was, and uh, to me, one of the, the best aspects of it is that I felt like I got uh, so much of what you do with your prose and the poetry. I felt when I finished the book, it was like a, a kind of a, 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 po a, a novel in poetry. I felt like I had a real sense of uh, Posey, of his world, and uh, Maybe just start right there, Wayne, um, about that, you know, your ability to, to write both poetry and prose and, and, and this book. Okay. Thanks for that, Ron. I, I would add to that list our friend John Lane. Yes. Uh, as, as novels and Definitely. poetry. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, Woodsmoke has some DNA that shares with, uh, I think, uh, John's character, uh, old Rob. Mm -hmm. and a little bit of DNA there with Tim Wayne Miller and the Briar Poems. And yeah. I would like to think that I went all the way back to some of the uh, really good Mad Farmer poems of, of Wendell Berry. I hate to mention myself in the same sentence with, with Berry, but um, there, there's a tradition here is, is what I'm trying to point out. And um, I have always written poetry um, since I was in probably high school anyway. I hope nobody has kept any of them uh, from those days, but um, it, it's, and, and there was one time that I was writing almost exclusively in haiku, which is exactly what you want your average Appalachian kid to be writing, right? Uh, but I went through that phase. Um, but I don't, I don't see a whole lot of, artificial barriers between poetry and prose. Um, I tend to construct a scene in a novel from an image, which is how one usually constructs a poem. You start out with a concrete image and you sort of flesh that out. Um, Woodsmoke came to me over a period of several years. Uh, the penultimate poem in the book is called Wood smoke, and it was originally published in Appalachian Heritage back in 2011. So that's this has been on my mind for a long time. I had no idea at that point who Posey Green was. Um, this was just a poem about, about some woman who's looking after some man and hoping that he's not going to die on her. And um, just I was working on a novel oh, two or three years ago, and Posey just sort of walked into my head and sat down and started talking. And I, I was irritated about it at first because I was working on another project. And um, then I said, you know, he won't go away. I better start listening to him. And he's kind of a quirky old man like me. And he works his firewood up by himself like I still do and this, that, and the other. And one thing led to another. And, and I figured that he ought to live to just about where I do, which is within sight of Mount Pisgah. And uh, let me just read a, a section of that poem, which introduces the collection, and maybe that'll start, start something rolling here. I think I'm going to read, actually, sections one and two on that, because the, the, this, well, there's a little bit of story in there, too. I've always lived in sight of Pisgah's crown, 10 or 12 crowback miles from Pole Creek, the peak a steadfast anchor for my soul. Twixt here and there, green folds of South Hominy's story feel like old friends shadowed by the mountain. It's stout, worthy, 
tall by more than a mile. The rock face halfway up they call the bride and groom, who after deep snow looked pleased as punch to marry. Two peaks to its left, a rat sneaks up the ridge. A rub lamp chini could conjure up no better sight to greet an old man's eyes at one more weary dawn. Mr. Vanderbilt used to own it, or at least had a deed, as if a mere man, even a tycoon, could own such godly land. Built a buck spring lodge where blue blood guests killed deer and bear and buffalo and made their servants cook and serve it. I peeked in there as a young and you could set a T-model Ford in the fireplace and a bearskin rug looked fit to eat you alive. Did I say buffalo? Around here? Well, Papa told it how Mr. Vanderbilt ordered half a dozen, male and female, three of each from way out west, where he thought money cured all ills, even buffalo drought. I was in Hominy Station when them things come off the train. Big old wooden crates of snorting and a grunting and a growling like something inside itched to kill something outside. Us ragtag hooky boys and our teacher too dogged them horse-drawn carts all the way up to all the way to a pin up cutthroat gap. First they let out the buffalo gals, then after they settled down, busted out the he beasts, named after various southern worthies. But if Daniel Boone and Verena Davis ever shared a lusty look of love, I never heard tell. I reckon the twain, the train ride or thin air one took the rut out of them. Soon the poor uprooted beast starved or ran off or just plain petered out. Some things even a millionaire can't fix. I love that. I would love for you to continue and read the third section because I, there are a couple of things there that really uh, struck me if you'd be willing to do that. Sure. Yeah. I was up Pisgah a fair amount, kept around deadfall fire when I, when I could sleep on the ground without being sucked into it. No poison oak past midway, clear water cold enough to crack your teeth, air smells sharp as a fallen axe, red spruce and he balsam big as smokestacks. You'd see eagles, snakes, big around as your arm. Papa said there was panthers, but I never heard one. Bisca Springs had many a creek full of orange and black spring lizards and mouth melting spectacles trout, pure waters that birth Davidson River, and the East Fork of Pigeon and South Hominy Creek. I never have been more taken with a view. Over a mile high, spy any direction, and ask if Moses seemed better when he looked from Gilead all the way to Zoar. I kind of doubt it myself. I like seeing chimney smoke from Candler Town and Etowah, Brevard and Waynesville, promised land for my people. We got to go in. All right. Um, I just, you know, several things about that uh, as I was reading the book and, and rereading it uh, to get ready tonight. I, I just love, one, is this beautiful line, clear water cold enough to crack your teeth. I mean, that the sounds, those hard C, you know, hard C sounds, uh, it's just perfect for that uh, description. I mean, that's where we see a real poet at work. But the other thing that just struck me is, how right every detail is. Those are orange and black spring lizards, I know. I mean, mm -hmm. I remember catching those as well, uh, particularly in spring houses. They seem to like spring houses. Yeah, you've, you've got those in some of your poems. Yeah, yeah, there's something about the magical and the speckled trout, of course. But I, I just felt like so much of, uh, of Posey's world was incorporated there. And also just... Um, this, this kind of Celtic idea of, of naming, uh, the magic of naming places. And, and that struck me as well in, in that particular scene, because I think that kind of naming is an act of love, uh, of the noticing. But the other thing uh, I, I wanted to talk about, and we see this here, and we also see it later in the poem, such as Greenwood, where you, uh, you say, the odor lingers, lays a hand on your shoulder, like an old friend you ain't seen in months. But that use of a, a simile, and I think with a character such as Posey, I think one way you, you show the creativity, and I think this is true of folk languages, whether it's Appalachian or Gullah, is that there is, there's real inventiveness in that. Um, 
and, and the ability to uh, create assembly. You have to be intelligent to do that because you're taking two things that are seemingly unalike. And as you do in this third section, you talk about um, you know, he balls some biggest smokestacks, you know, once again, making that those kind of comparisons. Mm -hmm. well, one, one, one thing I can probably say to that is that um, I have spent a lot of time over my years listening to old people uh, who came from a much more oral culture than we have been raised in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking particularly now of, of some of my older relatives and, and some of my wife's relatives in particular. Her great uncle was a fine storyteller and I would listen to him nearly every Saturday at work. He would come to work and be around and when I wasn't actually doing work, I was listening to Uncle Great. And um, I picked up a lot of these, I picked up a lot of um, odd, odd phrasing from him and also a lot of um, a lot of a lot of direction on how to tell a story. Uh, I've, I've never I've never formally studied writing. Um, I've taught writing. Uh, I've done it, but uh, I haven't had a course in creative writing, and I, I'm, I'm actually kind of glad it might have ruined me. <laughs> Well, I, I think uh, one aspect uh, of the book that I love, and I saw this in Catalucci too, uh, I think there's, there's always a, I think one thing art can do many things, but I think one thing art can do is, is, is not allow us to forget uh, a culture, mm -hmm. uh, um, a, a way of life, uh, our own ancestry. And, and I think these, these poems do that uh, very, very beautifully. Thank you. It, it's um, it, it, the the book was really a joy to write. I did not find that this was hard work at all. Um, it takes time, obviously, but uh, it uh, it was it was a labor of love. It really was. Um, can I read you a poem that I want to um, dedicate to my old teacher, Jake Mills? Sure, love to hear. Did you know Jake? I, I did not. Or did okay. I'm sure you know the, um, let's see, where is that, page 31. I, I'm sure you know the, um, the essay he wrote about dead mules in Southern fiction. Okay, I do know that, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is why my, all of my books have dead mules in them in one place or another. But um, this one is my dead mule pole. And, and for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, uh, Jerry Leith Mills was one of my professors at Chapel Hill. He was an expert in Renaissance uh, literature, British, uh, but he also was, was uh, interested in Southern literature. And back in the 90s, he wrote an essay about the equine Gothic and how Southern fiction does not depend on family. It doesn't depend on the land. It doesn't depend on religion. What is the signifier in it is, is there a dead mule in it? And it kind of goes from there. So here's my dead mule. Her name is Maud. Papa named our old brown mule out of the newspaper's funny pages. She didn't seem to mind day tall, even though she didn't kick all the time, like her namesake. I've heard a mule will gladly work 10 years for a man just for the chance to kick him once. Maud was like that, caught me just right one time. Knocked me arse over tea kettle into the fence. I hit her between the eyes with a single tree and I reckon she was waiting another 10 years for revenge when she up and died. I'd never seen a dead mule, but there she was in the lot on her side, attracting flies. I dug a hole behind her back. Time I'd finished, she was stiff as a poker, so her legs made good handles to turn her into it. Priced mule at the stockyard, but bought a tractor for the same money. A little red farm all I've regretted having since the day I brought it home. Oh, it's reliable enough, and it mostly does what I need it to do, but it's noisy and stinks and ain't got a lick of personality. I'd swap it for a good mule, even give a little boot, but nobody around here breeds mules anymore. What a world, full of sin and sorrow, Papa used to say. It sure ain't full of mules, mules no more, darn it all. 
Well, I would, uh, you know, one aspect of the book that I, I thought really kind of gave it um, uh, very much like a novel uh, in the best sense was uh, the fact that you included Susan McFall's poems because that gave us perspective on on Posey that we could not get just from his point of view. And I would love for you to read one of uh, her poems if you're willing. Okay, sure. Um, the, the little bit of story in this book uh, is that Posey has no neighbors. He's lived by himself for a long time. He's a widower. And all of a sudden he has a neighbor lady who's a poet and who's, I think she's about 30 years his junior, something like that. And they become friends in the story. So that's, that, was, that was what made me say, oh, the wood smoke poem I wrote 10 years ago, that's who's in there. And that's Susan's work and that's maybe she's talking about posing. Um, but let me read one called Oil by Sunshine that is Susan talking about her neighbor Posey. And you need to know for geography that her house is on a hill and it overlooks his place, which is down kind of on the terrace. From my porch, he looks so slight, an exclamation point in a ball cap, flannel shirt, fading gray overalls, ready to speak some firewood into being. I smile, grab a cup, sit and watch him move slow and smooth and simple as if oiled by sunshine or prayer, which some say fuels all good work. The laid clink of steel on steel tells the size of various piles. Nothing wasted, bark, limb, leaf, everything sorted, evening and morning, all is good. Noise stops, piles shrink, woodshed bulges, everything in its place like a shaker cabinet. Stove wood here, backlogs there, kindling by the door. Skinny old posy creates order from chaos. Warmth, even on cold days, he wipes his brow. So I suspect, does God. That's, that's, that's a really wonderful image there. Of the, I mean, it's, it's just one of those details that, once again, it makes you believe of, of a person of his time and place. It's kind of like uh, one thing I remember when I, the old men that I knew growing up, that, that when they opened their wallets, they would always kind of turn them this way so you couldn't see the money. And, and it's <laughs> those little details that just yeah. almost tell you about a generation of people even. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had a great uncle like that. Uh, he carried his billfold in the bib of his overalls, and it was always, as they say, big enough to choke a horse. Uh, he was a cattle dealer, and yeah. that was all cash, and that's just what he did. But uh, well, well I, I'm I'm interested. And I think the, the the listeners might be interested. I, I, I'm interested in your journey to become a writer. How did that begin for you? Did that begin with a love of the storytelling, of the reading, uh, all of the above? Really, that began in high school when I had an English teacher named Laura Harrell, and at Inca High here in Buncombe County, and she said that I needed to read *Look Homeward Angel*. I was probably 14, and that's a perfect time to read Look Homeward Angel. Absolutely. And I just remember talking to her about, you know, it would be so cool to be able to do something like this, you know, because Asheville just sort of came alive for me in that. And then she, she sort of, I was, I, I never did know whether she was making fun of me or not, but she said, Mr. Caldwell, one of these days you're going to write the great American novel. And that's back when people talked seriously about writing the great American novel. I guess before Philip Roth actually wrote the great American <laughs> novel. But any, anyway, um, like I said before, I had been writing a little bit of poetry. I don't, at that point, I hadn't, I hadn't written any kind of prose except for book reports and stuff. And I was really a fairly well-adjusted 14-year-old, and I didn't have anything to write about. So I just sort of put that away in the back of my mind for a while, went to school, um, did a lot of academic stuff, uh, taught for a couple of years in the academy, and thank God that didn't ruin me either, but, uh, and none of this is any offense to you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm done taking. laughs> but uh, anyway, 
um, I just always sort of had in the mind, in the back of my mind, I need to write something. And the year I turned 50, that really got to be a shout. If you're ever going to do it, let's do it. And um, that year, the Carolina Alumni Review had a contest, a short story contest. And I entered that and won first prize. And the motivation there was, was really clear. You get your picture in a slick magazine. They send you a check. And that's motivation. So I kept writing. And, and pretty soon, I think within three years of that, I had the basis for Catalucci. And it just sort of, it's continued from there. But um, I don't think, uh, you know, Lee Smith talks about always knowing that she's going to be a writer. Like she was writing stories when she was like five or six. That did not happen to me. It, it, took, it took a long time for this to incubate um, in, in my life. But, but that's sort of how I got, I got here. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I've always been amazed. Uh, I, I didn't even attempt to write until I was about 18. Uh, you know, I just, I love to read the, but it's interesting you bring up uh, Le Comme Ranger because that, that book, the more I uh, read about other writers, the influence that book had on people as far as wanting to be writers, uh, Randall Keenan, I know, mm -hmm. Smith, but also people you would never suspect. Uh, Philip Roth said that was the book that made him want to be a writer. Right. I, certainly, and, it, it was a huge book for me. Yeah. Right. And I guess I guess we all know that Lawrence Ferlinghetti died yesterday. Look, Homeward Angel is the reason he went to school at Chapel Hill. Yeah. And I didn't know that until I heard some people talking about his, his life yesterday. And you know, you, you're talking about a tradition that goes from Philip Roth to Lawrence Ferlinghetti, and I'm thinking of Pat Conroy, and yeah. you know, there's just all kinds of stops in between there. Uh, it's, yeah. it's 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 wide across the culture. Oh, it is. It's it, it really is. Uh, and uh, it 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 holds up. It's it's. A, but I think it is a book that it's almost crucial to read it when you're a teenager. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the people I know who've read it uh, who've come to it later, I just don't think. I mean, they, they could admire it, but I think it's a book you truly fall in love with. Yes, yes, absolutely. Why don't you read us another poem? No, I guess I could. Um, there's a lot of nature going on in this book. Uh, not that I class myself as a nature writer, but uh, old Posey observes things, and here's one that uh, I kind of like. It's called Bird Tree. You know spring or fall's a-coming when you see a bird tree. At least that's what I call it when them no-tailed blackbirds take to squeaking together. Might be two dozen in a walnut talking about joining up with a bigger bunch. Or, or might be hundreds of the varmints in a tall poplar yammering like rusty gates without regard to manners or respect. Go south. No, go north. No, George Yonder's got a map. No, he don't. If we fly east, we can roost at Martha's mother's folks. They got a tree over a clothesline and Lord's plenty of skeeters. Fooey. Head toward yonder black gum with the mistletoe up top. Just past it, a branch goes into a creek, then flows into the big river into Tennessee. That's north. Rivers don't flow north. This one does, bird brain. Didn't they learn you that in school? That, didn't they learn you that in school? You can rely on old Fred. He's got a compass. Well, shoot, what good's that to a bird? I say we find a peach orchard and get drunk. Where are you going to find one this time of year? Hot to mighty, there's a red tail. And they lift as one from the big old tree and head east then north quick like an oiled hinge and turn west almost to blot the setting yellow ball as they speed their way to where God's finger points. Well done. You know, it's just an exciting time, I think, for Appalachian writing. And, and we're getting to hear more voices that we haven't before. And I think one of the most exciting ones, I don't know if you've had a chance to read Annette Clapsaddle's book. I haven't yet. But that is a, a, a wonderful book. And, and to hear, you know, of that experience is, mm -hmm. I think, uh, very important. You know, uh, set in Cherokee, as you know, or may not know, but it also 
it's said in the region, but uh, it's, I, I think uh, it's interesting. I think there's a real momentum now uh, with, you know, and, and also a kind of opening up uh, aspects that we haven't seen uh, maybe uh, dealt with as much in Appalachian fiction, but it, it just seems like a good time. And uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just really uh, interested and uh, why, do you, why do you think that is? I mean, is it, just, is it the, re you know, I, I, I kind of think, you know, certain times it seems like the Harlan Renaissance, for instance, or what happened in Mississippi with Faulkner and Welty, but uh, it seems to have been pretty, pretty strong right now, too. Well, I don't have any deep thoughts about that, but I would like to think that it's because there's an awful lot of just human truth coming out of Appalachian writing. Yeah. And people are kind of hungry for that. Um, it, um, we, we, I don't want to get up on a soapbox here, but, uh, our society seems to have gotten away from some of the fundamental truths of the human heart as, as Faulkner might have put it. Yeah. Um, and I think that is still very strong in Appalachian lit. Um, even in writers like David Joy, his stuff is pretty dark, but he's, he's getting at that 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 kernel in there um my friend terry roberts has a new book coming out this summer uh an appalachian what you might call noir detective story mm -hmm. you know sort of breaching branching out into another sort of genre there yeah. um, well they're just a, yeah they're just a lot yeah. of voices silas house you know silas i know and, oh, yeah Crystal mm -hmm. Wilkinson up and, you know, these are writers that are a little higher, farther up the mountain than we are, but uh, it just, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's very exciting, I think. And, uh, you know, I think we're lucky to be a part of it. I think Lee Smith and uh, Chapel, right, you mm -hmm. know, they had something to do with it. And some of the writers such as Wilma Dykeman. Uh, mm -hmm. go, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Annette. She was glad, good enough to blurb wood smoke as you put yeah. on the back there. And for that, I'm very grateful. And uh, I am going to read her book soon. Oh, well, you, it's, it's a delight. Um, we've got a few questions. So um, I don't know if we can get those to show up on the screen. Um, I'll be glad to, Stephanie, if you can help. Or... Hi, yeah, I, I can just read those out if that will work for you and then you don't have to worry about the the screen uh, the screen stuff thank you so much for the conversation and the reading uh, to to both of you and um, we'll start with the the question for you Wayne about whether or not there's uh, an audio book in the works. Um, we have someone in the audience who just really enjoyed hearing you read. Um, I will say that I, I have some sense of how much work audio books are. So <laughs> that's no small, that's no small question. No, it's not. Um, I asked that same question to Robin, my editor at Blair. I believe Robin's in the audience tonight. She might speak to this later. Um, and I said, you know, if there's going to be an audio book I'd like to read it and she said well we don't have plans for that right now but you'll be the first one we ask if we do so you know and and there was a famous line I don't know how famous it is but there's a line I've all I've, I've really known from Guy Clark one of his songs he says there ain't no money in poetry and that may be the reason there ain't no audio book for wood smoke. I don't know, but uh, I guess we'll have to see how that, how that goes. Um, because you're right, Stephanie, those things take forever to do. And um, if you do it right, and um, I mean, there may just be not, not be a budget for wood smoke on that. Well, it is, I think with poetry, even more than prose, uh, if you can hear, the, uh, the writer's voice sometimes it, it really helps you I mean you hear that voice I, I, I heard Seamus Heaney read you know probably 30 years ago mm -hmm. and, uh, every time I hear his voice I, I you know I, it it match you know it makes me or not allows me to inhabit those poems on a, another level right 
So I, I have a, a question that I, I think also overlaps with a, a comment that I noticed in the chat, but it's something that I always like to ask about. And um, Wayne, we'll start with you, but Ron, if you would like to, to chime in as well, uh, please feel free. And just always curious about how characters live with authors, um, how they appear, um, the, the space they might inhabit, you know, in your, in your minds, perhaps even in your day-to-day -day lives, how they come and go. Um, and so Wayne, I wonder if you could speak to that uh, about both of the characters really that, that are inhabiting Wood Smoke. Well, I, back before I became a writer, I heard people, Lee Smith particularly, talking about characters inhabiting her mind. And I thought, in my innocence, this sounds a little like mental illness, but uh, it's, it's not really. And that's what they do, at least in, in, in my experience. I don't know that, uh, that Posey is going to talk to me anymore. Um, I've got three or four more poems than, than were included in Wood Smoke uh, that I've written in the last little while. So maybe there's gonna be some more interaction. Uh, Susan's being very quiet. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen about that. Um, I've also got some characters from Catalucci that are still living with me. Uh, I'm through with Ezra Banks and he's dead and I'm glad, but uh, there's, a kid, there's a kid named Ras Carter in, in one of those books that I think deserves his, another book. And I've written a novel about that that has not gotten off the ground yet. Matter of fact, that's one thing I've done today. I've rewritten a chapter of that. And We'll see if that, that goes, but yeah, they keep living with you. Um, in, in many ways, some of my characters are more real to me than people I know. You know, just because I think about them more and they kick around in my mind and all of that, and you know, call it mental illness or whatever you want to call it, that's what happens. Well, I, yeah, and I actually, when I, I, my last book in the Valley, I, I actually went back to uh, uh, the Serena, to you know, and I, I didn't want to do that. I, I definitely didn't want to write a novel. I didn't want uh, Ghostbusters Part Two, but there was a character named Ross in that book uh, that was in Serena, and his story and and that character had haunted me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I just kind of felt compelled to go back because he wouldn't leave me alone. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and I'm glad you did. That's a good story. Well, and there's there's a segue. Another another question that asks if there are enough uh, is, is Posey still telling stories, um, and and would that perhaps lead to a sequel to Wood Smoke? That's always a possibility. I I wouldn't throw it out. I don't have enough I don't have enough critical mass yet to say yeah I'm on my way to doing something. Um, he's I guess you call Posey's kind of, he's there, but he's kind of taking a vacation. And if, if we get back to that point then, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll certainly think about that. So we have a, a question that again, I think will be for both of you. Um, are viewers interested in your respective ideas about, uh, about persona narratives? Um, and is saying that Wayne's are wonderful. And do you think that being fiction writers helps you write persona poems? Um, uh, and, and, and Ron, I think in talking to Wayne, you've spoken a little bit about the, you know, the voice that sort of resonates in both genres, but if you could uh, maybe both speak to that, um, starting with you, Wayne. Go ahead, boy. Oh, okay. Um, Probably my best response to that is uh, I don't see a whole lot of difference in writing a poem and writing prose in that I approach it more or less the same way. I start with an image and I, I work around that and I see if I can accrete things to that image to, to make it, you know, flesh it out and make it come alive. If it doesn't come alive, I toss it in the metaphorical wastebasket. Um, and I do the same thing with that with a poem. 
Um, and that's, that's just sort of how I do that sort of thing. I see one skill feeding the other, in short. Um, I don't consider myself primarily a poet, or I don't consider myself primarily a fiction writer. I just consider myself to be a writer. Well, it's it uh, it's uh, the persona of poems. I've actually done that. Uh, one of you know my first book of poems dealt with uh, the migration of uh, a lot of people from uh, our region going into the cotton mills, and I had a lot of persona poems there, and. Uh, what I tend to do with persona poems is I, I love to use metrics. Uh, I use very often use a, uh, I am a trameter or a pentameter, but I, I really, I, I'm always afraid that I'm gonna allow the voice to become no different from what I've been doing uh, in mm -hmm. my poems. And um, in, in my poetry, I, it, it very, it's very different. I haven't, you know, it, it, I've been writing a lot of prose in the last few years and I, it's hard to get back for me. I mean, this is me. I think Wayne, and I know Robert Morgan. Well, I think you guys can do this easily, more easily than I can. But um, if I'm not, you know, if I, if I kind of get off away from poetry, it's hard for me to get back because for me, it's all about sound, sound play. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I view a, a poem as a, as a net 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 uh, for catch, uh, for catching sound so uh, I, I won't really you know kind of welsh hopkins like sound intense poetry mm -hmm. Very I'm not speaking to uh, form um i don't there's there's one sonnet in my book for example um but i when i did an academic study of poetry it was always the form that was so important in that mm -hmm. Um, you know, starting with Spencer and going up through Dunn and Herbert and all of those guys. Um, but I don't, I don't consciously think about the form. I don't consciously think about the rhythm. I do think about the sound. But after I've got the thing down on paper and said, okay, this actually flows from point A to point B to point C, then I work on the metrics. Do you, is it, does that conform to the way you work or well, is that I, typical I, or, I, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, well, for my last few books of poetry, I've used a syllabic line. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated with Welsh poetry because my ancestry is Welsh, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, a lot of it. And uh, they, uh, they you know, I like uh, what the Welsh do, you know, Hopkins, Dylan Thomas, you know, though I sang like the chains and my, that kind of, you know, music. Uh, so I have a really, I tend to do a, I tend to work in seven syllable lines and, uh, uh, the, the, you know, I try to do some things with internal rhyme, uh, alliteration, assonance, those are the kind of things, but, mm -hmm. uh, and you hope it, it's not too obvious. I mean, you hope the reader almost doesn't notice it. Uh, you hope, you know, kind of sneak up on the reader, but the ear hears it, but that's, that's just kind of the way I work. I think we all find uh, what works best for us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I generally find that when I try to write a sonnet, it's just wood. It just sits there on the page and does absolutely nothing. Uh, I kind of like the one that's in this book, but uh, that, you know, when I when I try to squeeze something into a form, I normally fail. I I want to uh, interject another of of my questions. That's um, Again, something I just, I always appreciate hearing authors talk about, um, which is just your process. And um, I know some folks are um, sort of like by the clock, you know, certain time of day, you write, certain, you know, and then you eat and sleep and then you get up and repeat. Um, and others not so much, um, and and especially with with both of you working in more than one um, method of writing, um, I'd I'd be curious to hear you both talk a little bit about just how you write, you know, what that looks like. Well, I, I can speak to the way I do it, which is very sloppy and haphazardly. Uh, I'm not the kind of guy like my friend Terry Roberts who can get 
get up at five o'clock every morning and sit himself in front of a computer screen and, and do that. Um, I just can't do that. I don't work from an outline. Um, I, try to, I try to write something every day, usually in the evening, usually as, as a journal entry. Um, if, if there's a kernel of something in that journal entry, I make a note of it and I'm on to it probably the next day or two. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I've never been the kind of writer who does it like a job. Uh, I don't punch a clock with it and I don't think that I could. Uh, I, I'm a, I, I cannot get away from my Protestant childhood. <laughs> I, I tend to, uh, to, to, to be very rigid. Uh, I, you know, I've been, I, I tend to get uh, uh, pretty much three, you know, anywhere from three to eight hours a day. I, I, I'm, I'm doing less as I get older on this, but I'll try to get in at least three or four hours every day. And, I, you know, uh, that, there are pros and cons to that. I, it's almost a lot of times something doesn't come. It's as if I'm punishing myself, you know, just kind of waiting. But, uh, but eventually, uh, you know, I, I do hope it comes. But um, I think uh, I think every writer has to do it differently. I find I have more energy. I, I am very much a, a very structured person. I like knowing exactly what I'm going to be doing at a certain time. I tend to like to write more in the mornings, early afternoons, then wind down. Um, but, um, the, you know, the other thing I do, I'm very stubborn, uh, and I don't know if this happens to you, Wayne, but, but every novel I've written, uh, my novels always start with an image. And I think a lot of what you do does the same, but, uh, you know, when I, when I wrote Serene, all I had was an image of a woman on horseback and I, I don't plot either. I don't outline, but I, one thing I, I, I do believe, I, I think writers have to have certain, lies that they believe is that, uh, uh, yeah, Michelangelo believed that when he saw the, the big marble chunk of stone that the, uh, the statue was already in there, you know, all you had to do was find it. And what I, what I find is that when I write novels and, and, and very often when I write short stories, not so much with poetry, um, that there, there, there will come a time when it just will not work. And I, I have to believe that it will, that, it, that if my, uh, if I'm so obsessed with this image that, that it'll come and, and, and it usually does, but you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting how, you know, I think writers are very superstitious. I mean, I think <laughs> with you is that you don't want to force it, you know, if it's not there. Yeah. Um, I tend to just kind of be awaiting it but the more I write, the more where the stories come from is so mysterious. Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm a Jungian. I mean, I really think that writers very often are, it's almost as if we're like radio towers and, and, and we're kind of, you know, the signals sometimes hit us if we're lucky and, and, and we get the, uh, the news. That's an interesting image. Well, probably insanity too. <laughs> well, there, there's a there's a lot about this craft that is is a mystery, and, and you're right. And, and I think I think maybe one of the reasons for that is what we're looking for is, if not to explain the mystery, at least to lay it out so other people can see it. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, and I, I think that's I don't know that I can answer questions in my work I, I i view myself more as a witness i just want to put it mm -hmm. out but uh it, it truly is uh mysterious uh i mean why you know why you know did you suddenly say okay i'm going to write you know why did posey kind of show up yeah in, yeah in your subconscious or conscious or whatever and uh, but that's kind of the uh in a way it kind of makes as, as, as you know, writing can be sometimes very, a very unpleasant life if you commit to it. But, but those moments when it, when it comes, it's, uh, I mean, it really feels like some kind of almost grace or a gift. Uh, it, mm -hmm. it, and, mm -hmm. and I think there are moments 
when uh, you start to realize, well, I'm a lot smarter on the page and a better <laughs> person than off it. <laughs> it's pretty funny, too. Yeah, I hear you. Um, I'd just like to start by saying I'm, I'm, I'm now, my mind is sort of full of this idea of, of writing is tapping into the collective unconscious um, that, <laughs> um, which, yeah, that'll, so something for everyone to chew on for the next little bit, perhaps. <laughs> um, and, and we had another question, which I've, I feel like has been talked around a little bit um, um, from someone who I know has been in events before and was asking about your characters, Wayne, not being able to imagine going back to, you know, people who were there on the land before them, specifically indigenous people. And, and I think there's, there's something that I've picked up on in the conversation. And we talked, for instance, about Annette Clapsaddle, who is a member of the Eastern Band of, of Cherokee, writing the story that she needs, that she needs to write. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it, you know, and, and so I just want to lift up the idea of people, people, not, not that we can't use our imaginations to dive into other people's stories, but lift up the idea of, of people having the space to tell their own stories and, 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 uh, and ensuring that there's enough space, what, what is changing and needs to continue to change mm -hmm. is ensuring that there's enough space for more people to tell their own stories rather than so that, you know, you, you know, Posey uh, comes to you from your, your background, your, a combination of your, your imagination and your, and your background. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, so uh, yeah, I think, I think an appreciation of just getting to the place, Ron, which you were speaking about earlier um, and, and naming several writers in Appalachia who quite frankly, don't fit the picture that a lot of people have of Appalachians, right? <laughs> there are <laughs> black and brown people here always have been. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, the fact that then when you have the space that, you know, you don't need to try to conjure that up. There are people here who can write those, mm -hmm. those stories. So I just want to say, I appreciate, uh, Mary, you know, bringing that into the conversation and you, and, and you discussing that. Um, uh, as well. And so <clears throat> we have a request uh, that I would like to give to you, which is, uh, could you read and or discuss the poem Dogwood? Um, there's someone who would love to hear about the significance and inspiration behind that poem. Okay. First, let me find it. Uh, there's Dog Days. And I realize this is a little bit on the spot, so, and we don't have any hold music, so, <laughs> Ron, if you. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, but we just, could uh, just, I'm off the hook. He's yeah, got to find it. It's just, but I here just we are. It. Like, it's live, and we're here, and yeah. And, and I found it, so I'll read Excellent. it and give you what little bit of uh, insight I can to it. Posey says, I'll burn most anything. I've sawed and stacked cherry, locust, tulip wood, oak, walnut, apple, apple, sourwood, ash, hickory, ironwood, bittersweet, birch, privet, grapevine, sycamore, gum, holly, maple, poison oak, beech. Even been known to use spruce pine if dry as last year's bird nest, but I won't burn dogwood. It's hard as a rock. So if I find a dead one, I'll make it into hammer handles or butchering blocks but I won't burn it. I ain't superstitious, but they say Christ was killed on a dogwood cross. That ain't in the book, but I ain't taking no chances. Besides, Indians say dogwood people help us humans out, so I'll not make them little folk mad. When dogwood flowers, I'll plant corn. Come fall, I'll watch birds after berries, and God willing, all things will be well. All will be warm, and well, and if I were to explicate this thing, I would say that uh, probably I'm trying to balance a Christian and a and a, uh, a naturist view 
point on this tree. Um, I'm, uh, Ron, you said writers are superstitious. Posey's real superstitious, even though he makes fun of his daddy for being that way. Um, but, you know, I've, I've seen that old postcard about, you know, with a picture of the dogwood on the front of it, an Easter poem on it. I've seen that here around here all my life. And that's what Posey's referring to there. It ain't in the Bible, but, and there's another poem in here called, uh, I think it's called Olive Branches, that talks about the different kinds of firewood they had back in the biblical days. I don't know if they had dogwood back then, but anyway, uh, that's neither here nor there. Um, but there's a Cherokee uh, tradition about dogwood people who were, as I understand it, kind of like small forest people who help humans out when they're in trouble. Um, they, they're good people. They, they're, they're not demons. They, they, they help you out. And Posey believes in that enough that he wants to be careful not to offend those little guys either. Um, so he's using dogwood for very practical things. He's making hammer handles and things like that out of it. He's using it as a, a, a sign. I know to plant my corn when, the, when, when it starts to bloom. Um, and then he's just, he's just being very careful of it otherwise. Now, that may, may not be deep enough to suit our questioner, but that's that's where I'm coming from off of my poem. I think that's pretty good. I, I think we got to thank you for that questioner for reading the poem. And I think that I think that answer was plenty deep. <laughs> thank you, Wade. Sure. Um, I, um, we don't have time for it now, but um, a whole other discussion about magic. Um, uh, feels called for as well. It's 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 come up a lot, and I and I love embracing um, the idea of of magic as real in the lives of so many people across so many cultures, and and you know, and even though the specifics might be different, as something in common with so many people in this region in particular, but everywhere. Um, so I uh, I'll just want to say I appreciate you. Well, I, I love that aspect. I, I, I mean, I know we're running out of time, but uh, I'll tell you a, a really interesting story. Just Please. Would not let me, uh, uh, I, I love to catch salamanders and crayfish as a child, but uh, she would not let me, uh, you know, do that near the spring house. And later I, I began to realize that she kind of, she viewed those salamanders that that life as uh, you know, kind of guardian spirits of that water. But mm -hmm. as you get older, as I got older, I also realized that environmentally, that made absolute sense because if the water's not pure, those creatures and that kind of connectedness uh, to, as, as Posey has in your book, Wayne, to nature, I think is, um, you know, and folklore and magic and that sense of mystery of how the natural world and and, and, and human beings connect. Uh, yeah, I, I'm fascinated with that. So I, that's a, I, I, that would be a good good uh, hour. <laughs> it would, it would. That, that would take a while. It, it really would, and I appreciate that, Ron. And, 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 and both of you for, you know, sort of appreciate, reflecting that in your work that, it, you know, that, that connection um, to the land and nature and this and it's and it's not a an abstract like exclusive to um, um, some sort of stereotypical tree hugger kind of thing it's 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 real and and is not newfangled either right this idea that <laughs> you know um, it's interesting how we've gotten to this point to to you know, like think about environmentalism as something that, you know, like, you know, that, that this very narrow looking group of people came up with a few years ago to, you know, to, to make oil companies mad. And that's not, you know, and that's not it at all, right? No. We've, we've and, always and been I in think, relationship with the land. Yeah, yeah, and I think what, you know, wood smoke does and a lot of other really good work, you know, that uh, you have to notice the world before you can care about it. And I think the a kind of attentiveness that poetry 
and literature can can very and nonfiction, good nonfiction can do it. it it'll, you know, we have to see the world to care. And uh, in a technological society we live in, you know, we have this illusion that uh, we're not connected. So we'll um, we'll just, we'll just think on think on that about how we can set up an hour about magic and fo folklore and mm -hmm. and nature. Um, and uh, put myself on the spot here too. But, yeah, maybe we'll make that happen. <laughs> Some people in the chat seem to like the idea. Um, uh, but no commitments required. <laughs> Um, so it's, you know, we're at the top of the hour now, and I, I would like to, um, uh, because I, we want to be conscientious about your time and everyone's time, I just want to thank you both again for the conversation this evening, Wayne, for your, for your reading, um, and uh, to congratulate you again on the publication of Wood Smoke. Thanks thank again to, to Blair for making that happen. Ron, thank you for your wonderful, insightful questions and, and for speaking with us as well tonight. And I want to leave it with, um, with you two, anything that you would like to leave us with this evening as we say goodnight to our audience. Well, I'll let Wayne have the last word, but I'm just delighted with the book. Um, it's enriched my life, and that's what we hope literature can do. Actually, there's a there's a wonderful quote by a Portuguese poet, uh, and, I, and I'll butcher his name if I attempt it, but he says, uh, literature is proof that life is not enough. Hmm. Wow. Well, Ron, thank you for those kind words, and I would like for the audience to see a copy of your In the Valley which uh, I understand is going to be out in paperback soon, but you can get your own autographed copy of the hardcover at Malaprops. Uh, well, just, we'll, we'll do this too, so yeah. yeah just in time for uh, <laughs> you, whatever's coming up. Um, um, say there's always a independent yeah. bookstore, yeah. There you go, there you go. <laughs> so, I, have, I have enjoyed this hour. Thank you. I have too. Thank you both so much. Um, and... Uh, uh, for being wonderful writers and independent bookstore boosters. We always appreciate it. Thanks again to everyone who's joined us this evening and we look forward to seeing you all again and sometime down the road back in the, in the bookstore, but we're happy to spend this virtual uh, time with you in the interim. Uh, please uh, stay safe and stay well. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks so much. Thank Good night. You,